Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Good to be here with you today. We're having a service to talk about our reconciliation in Christ. And that is in everything. That's God's good news to us as His children. The title today is Our New Identity is in Jesus Christ. Uh, we've just gone through a season of remembering the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And when these two events happen every year, they remind us of what a great price has been paid for us. We truly belong to Jesus, and He wants us to. He wants us to identify with Him because He is our best friend. And He wants the best for us. And He Amen. wants us not to be embarrassed by His name. And I know that the devil wants us to feel embarrassed about His name, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't give in to that temptation because, you know, today we're having in our society this great big question about it identity politics, which brought to mind the need to talk about what our true identity is. Uh, we don't belong to ourselves anymore, but yet in belonging to Jesus, He gives us free freedom, complete freedom. And He wants us to be able to do whatever we feel is the right thing to do. Because He's given us our giftings, we have these urges to do things to help other people. And if we follow the lead of the Spirit, then we believe in Him. Spirit leads us to Jesus. Jesus is all truth. He helps us to understand what our identity is. So even though we have giftings that, that are unique to us, our identity for all of us is in Jesus. So let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5 as we begin and see how th this new creation we are is described by the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, and isn't that interesting how the word is used to compel? It doesn't force us, it encourages us, it motivates us to go and be aware of the love that we have received. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died, so there's no more death that needs to occur. Uh, we die to ourselves when we come to Jesus because we repent of not knowing Him before that time. And, but He's taken care of all the dying that needs to be done. And He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. See, so we should live for Jesus because of His giving His life for us. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. See, he's, he was the human Jesus, and now he's the spirit Jesus. And so he's now our God in heaven, he sits at the right hand of the Father, he's our living high priest. He, we need to look up and see him, and then we need to look in and see him in our living, in our lives and appreciate that He's always there for us. So, in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. And we are that new creation, all of us. Uh, he comes and identifies with us, and He wants us now to identify with Him. And by doing so, He lives in us, and we do live in Him through the Spirit. And that's a wonderful relationship. We are His new creation. So each new creation, every person in other words, who believes in Jesus is the one who's the recipient of that identity. Now even though we're all identifying with Jesus, we're all special. We're, no, no two of us are alike, exactly. We have our own spiritual identity. And it's unique <laughs> because we have been given special giftings from birth to be who we are today. So. We're similar, we belong to the same one who gave his life for us, but he makes us understand we're all his, but we are all his in a particular relationship. It's special, the relationship is for each one of us. So the old is gone, the new is here through the Spirit of God. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So when Jesus died on the cross and He rose from the dead, that which God purposed from the, before the foundations of the world was completed, was finished. 
and uh, therefore we are the recipients of that finished work, which is what? Well, Paul describes it that the reconciliation has taken place. You see, the relationship with God was broken in the garden because of sin, and it was that way until sin could be paid for. But it took a sinless person to pay for the sins of Adam and us. So, we had to wait till Jesus, who was the one and only begotten Son of God, to come and be that perfect sacrificial gift. So he paid for the sins of all humanity, and we were the recipients, and we were reconciled. We were reconciled to our Father in Christ, and therefore we are one with Him and one with Jesus and one with the Holy Spirit today. So He's given us this ministry. We, he wants us to participate with Him. Our identity, He wants us to join with His identity in us and participate with the ministry He does in the world. To help others know the good news that we have been given reconciliation with God. And with God, then, with each other. So, what a wonderful ministry it is. And that ministry is that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and He's committed to us the message of reconciliation. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. So here, you and me. You know, you have to identify with something to proclaim it. Isn't it true? I know it's true with me. Um, so many things, you know, we kind of have arm's distance. I, I, I think that's true, but I'll keep it over here. And I'll, I'll keep this over there. And this niche there, I'll put that thought and that feeling. And we only really share the things that we identify with, don't we? Because somebody might say, well, I don't, I don't agree with you. So, oh, you don't agree with me? Well, I don't know what to do. Well, so we have to think of a way that we're going to respond to that, that non-agreement. And it's that we're going to give ourselves and say, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'd like to talk about it if you want to hear me. Uh, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Well, okay. Well, then you just love them and minister to them anyway. See, you don't have to say anything. You just have to do what Jesus would do in and through you and me, of course, all of us. So we are reconciled and therefore we're ambassadors. As though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So there it is. We will only do that if we identify with the true identity that we have in Christ. And... Uh, so we want to realize that physical identity is not as important as spiritual identity. You get a lot of misinformation when you try to identify with yourself physically. Some of it good, some of it not. The only true identity that helps us in life is our spiritual identity. Therefore, we need a heritage to look at, to go back to. Where do, where do I come from in this identification? In our case, it comes from Jesus. See, once the love of the Father was sent to us in Him to be the propitiation for our sins, well then that began our heritage in Christ. Uh, he was the one looked forward to by all the prophets of old. And here He was. And they didn't receive Him, but He was here anyway. And He was going to do what God sent Him to do, to fulfill God's will. So we realize that it was God's love for us that gives us the desire to begin with to want to identify with Him. But over in um, Ephesians, the second chapter, we say it's by grace that we are saved, not by works that we would do through salvation. But since it's God's idea to save us through Jesus, to show His love to us in that way, it is that we recognize that it is His grace that He's given to us that saves us in the relationship. So Ephesians 2 and verse 8, 
For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's God's desire to identify first with us so that we could then identify with Him in Christ. So, and He says, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's not a prideful thing, it's a rejoicing thing. It's a, it's a thing of celebration. Kind of like, you know, you whistle while you work. You know, you have a skip to your walk. You feel good about where you're going because you know it's already been given to you. You just need to be participating in the journey you're in with your one true love. And that true love is Jesus because He's the full expression of God's love to us. Then in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Even though we're not saved by works, we're created to participate with Him and minister to others in the good works He's given us to participate with Him. And therefore, it's a blessing to Him for us to receive that and to utilize those good works He's given us to express. And it's also a tremendous blessing to us to see how we are God's handiwork and how He uses each one of us totally in a unique way and yet in a similar way of His love for the benefit of others. And God prepared us in advance for us to do this. See, we're not a, an afterthought. Oh no, what am I going to do with that person? Where'd they come from? <laughs> you know, we, we like to say, you know, perhaps jokingly, but not usually. It doesn't really come from a joking heart. And that is, we were behind the door when all the good gifts were passed out. See, it's kind of an excuse to think, well, I don't think God gave me anything of value. We don't really realize what we're saying if we think the thought. The devil wants us to think the thought because the devil wants us just to do, nix the whole thing. <laughs> just have an excuse not to do anything at all in particular and just see what happens. But again, you know, we've been, by God's design, <laughs> We've been given this wonderful opportunity to express His handiwork. And it is gorgeous, you know. You see all the flowers in the field, all the beautiful birds that are singing their lullabies right now. And you say, wow, that's just a small part of His creation. And look at it. Well, we're a great part of His creation. And look at us and how we should rejoice in what He has done and is doing in us. So over in Matthew 11, we see how Jesus wants us to participate with Him. Always been intrigued by Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. It's so complex and yet so straightforward at the same time. It's complex because it's something we don't tend to think about and apply. But when we do, we see it. We, it just kind of burst forth in, in living color. Well, let's see what you think about it here today as we go through this. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, Jesus says to us, all you who are weary and burdened. And for all of us, that happens sometime or the other. And some of us, it happens way too often. And we feel exactly that way. And I, Jesus says, will give you rest. So sometimes we lay down and we just can't rest, you know, we're just nervous, upset, or bothered, and we just can't seem to let it go. But we know we need to because we feel so burdened by it all. In verse 29, take my yoke upon you. So let's just say, identify with Jesus. He says, identify with me. You take my yoke on you because you believe in me. I'm the one who's going to give you rest and your soul needs it. Everybody's soul needs it. So it, here he is, he says, this is my answer to your petition. This is how I'm going to give you rest. You gotta trust me. You have to identify with me because you need to come into my yoke. And that's the answer. And what is his yoke? And learn from me. 
See, when we identify with Him, then we say, yes, tell me all you are in my life. I want to know. I want to know all the secrets of how to live life fully. And He's going to then show us because we're right there with Him. You know, yoke to yoke. Well, we're in the same yoke, actually. So it's not two yokes, one yoke. His yoke. And we're in there to learn all about Him. And that's the best place we can be because He knows about life and eternal life. And He has the abundance of it that He wants to share with us all the time. So He says, For I am gentle and humble in heart. Amen. Amen, right? It's just, see, I, the reason you want to do this is because I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You know, the perfect person you'd want to be in the yoke with. Because you know that he's not going to do anything to hurt you or to misuse you in any way or to embarrass you or make you feel less than. He wants you always just to feel wonderful mm -hmm. because that's how he feels toward us. And therefore, he wants us to appreciate who he is, that he's always been gentle and humble in heart. And see, that's God's nature. God's nature is love and humility, the two greatest attributes of God as we know Him in Christ. And then you will find rest for your souls. So as I lay myself down to sleep every night, I say a prayer. Hopefully everybody else does too. It's good therapy. But it's not just therapy. It's talking to our Creator, our Savior, our Lord, master our king and i say i got some issues lord would you please help me work them out i need to rest but while i'm resting could you handle these things for me i worked all day on them and i couldn't get them done and they're bothering me so would you do these things for me lord and he says yes for he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light so it's like uh you know you can envision, you know, like two cattle that are put in the yoke to draw the plow, and you have a lead cow or horse, whichever it be, or mule, <laughs> and uh, and and the other one's going to follow, probably a younger one, learning how to be the lead one. And so, with Jesus, he's the elder. He's the ancient of days. And he's going to pull, and we're going to go with him. So all the weight of the pulling is on him. So he says, but I want you right here next to my shoulder. Because you're going to feel like you're doing it too. That you're actually participating. You're actually pulling the plow. You know, making the furrow wide so that seed can be planted in there for a great fall harvest and therefore, or spring harvest, and so therefore I want you to feel like you had a part, a very significant part in this happening. And even though you realize, you know, it was, he did it all, he allows us to take that credit of participating with him. And then we feel, I feel great, I feel rested, I feel energized, and I want to be in this relationship for eternity. I'm in. <laughs> I want I want this to go on forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Romans 8, if you'll turn there, um, we see here how how the Father calls us his children in Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 14. Because we're his children and we belong to Jesus. Romans 8, 14, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, and the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. So there's no fear in being the children of God. Only love. Love is all who God is. God is nothing else but love. And the fruits of that love are the fruits of the Spirit. So these are all things we desire to be in our living. So rather the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. 
So when we believe in Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit indwelling in our hearts, and therefore we are brought into that, that spirit of sonship. So, as it says, your adoption to sonship. See, we, we've been adopted as full sons or daughters of God, not, not anything separated from the actual son, Jesus. See, in other words, God treats us the same way as he treats his son, Jesus. Well, it takes Jesus is okay to do that, but he has, see, he came to do the will of the Father. He knew this was going to be the case for us, that we would have the full authority and responsibility of being children of God. There are some responsibilities to be a child of your parent. And God is our parent who loves us unconditionally. So he's brought us into this relationship he had with his only begotten son, Jesus, who was born of Mary, a virgin. And therefore, he's in that relationship. So he went before us. He secured that position. He went through his death and his resurrection. And here he is saying, Father, now include them all to be with me in your relationship for eternity. So there you are. It says, and by him, see, because he's adopted us as his children, we cry out, Abba, Father. It's the most endearing expression of Father we can have. You know, like Daddy, Papa. You know, totally respectful because the, the whole desire is to be, you love me that much? I can't believe it. Can you imagine that? And so, yes, yes we can. There he is. He's our Abba Father. And then the Spirit in verse 16, it himself testifies with our spirit, the spirit that God blew into our bodies to give us breath, that we are God's children. See, there's a testifying between God's spirit and our spirit that yes, we are, the children of God. So we have to realize though that that's true, that it's actually happening. You see, the sounds of the world can kind of mask out God's sounds of receiving and blessing us in relationship. And verse 17, now if we are children, oh, see, we're adopted, right? But we are full children, but with all the inalienable rights of mm -hmm. the child of God. Well, then we are heirs, see? Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So again, Jesus said, Father, I've done this for you, but I've done this for them. I want them to have the same blessings that I have with you. The same blessings that I have with you. Now, now who is Jesus now? See, as we identify him as our Savior, well, now he's our brother. And now he's our co-heir. And in John 15, now he's our friend. Mm -hmm. Because we identify with him, because he first identified with us. Who paid the great price. But there's a caveat to anything that has blessing and authority and opportunity. What is that? Well, you got to participate. <laughs> you got to participate. You got to be one with the team. You know, you got to you got to get in there and be one of the children of God and the co-heirs of Jesus. And, because he says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, or his ministry in other words. Because ministering to others in need has its sharing of suffering as well. Just, just what it is. So he ministers to us first, then we minister to others. In order that we may also share in his glory. See, so if you identify with him, then... You invest in Him and what He's doing. And that's what we do. Over in John 17. 
the prayer before Jesus went to the cross. He prays for all of us today. In John 17 and verse 20, he said this to his Father. John 17, 20, my prayer is not for them alone. Talking about his original disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which we have done today. In verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That kind of oneness. Well, it has to happen through the Spirit, because how else can we do it? See, so we share the same Spirit of God in Christ, known as the Holy Spirit. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So when we identify with Jesus, then see, we are in the Father. So then that shows those who don't know yet the relationship we have with Jesus, that that's how it is. See, we, we recognize that it, Jesus invites us into himself then, he is in the Father, so we are in the Father too. It's because of the Father's love that Jesus came, and therefore we're the recipients of that blessing, and now we share that by loving one another as Jesus has loved us. So may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. That's oneness. That's true oneness right there. So that they may be brought to complete unity. That's believing. That's identifying with Jesus. That's participating with Him. That's learning from Him day after day. Learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior day after day, moment after moment. We go down the path and He talks to us and He walks with us and He shares Himself by the way. And here we are. We go down the path of life. We learn and learn and learn from Him. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So at the end of all this journey we come to 1 John 3. Jesus returns in glory and we've been anticipating this for many years and it's finally come. And we're going to see the one that we identify with face to face. And here he is, as 1 John 3, verse 1 talks about. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. See, the world didn't identify with Jesus. But we did. So hopefully, as we share that, others will too understand and receive that. In verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will has not yet been made known. See, we look through a glass darkly still, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And the most amazing thing is, He'll appear as Jesus. He'll have the form of Jesus when He was on the earth, but He'll be glorified. And we'll see Him as He is, because we'll have our form, but we'll be glorified too mm -hmm. at the resurrection. Amen. And we will see each other perfectly. You see, our identity in Him today, then, is what our identity is going to be with Him in the wonderful world tomorrow. The new heavens and the new earth. Hallelujah and praise God. See, it goes from beginning to end. Our faith will be there to guide us all the way. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. We truly have the best friend we could ever have. And He lives in our heart. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message today of how we have been given the identity of Jesus. Help us to embrace that. That is precious. And we ask and pray, dear God, that You'll grant us wisdom and understanding as to how to express that wonderful relationship with others.
people we know, friends, co-workers, neighbors, people we meet in the supermarket sometimes, and it's just amazing the conversations that can happen there. But dear God, we ask and pray for your blessing and your inspiration in our hearts that we'll receive what we've been given in Jesus to participate with him in his ministry work all around the world, that you'll help us to be your children, co-heirs with Christ, and the friends of Jesus, and that we'll be to your honor as you have been to ours, and be blessed and help us as we go forward to say thank you, God, for loving us so much. So it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray these things, and all together we say, Amen. Amen.